Surviving Autocracy. I'm Marcia Eli, Executive Vice President of the Brooklyn Historical Society. We had the honor of hosting Masha at BHS in 2017. At that time, their prescient comments of caution for our country reflected the actions at the beginning of the Trump administration. Today, three years later, I can think of no one whose perspective and insights are more important as we witness one violation or attempted violation of the foundations of our democracy after another. We are absolutely thrilled to bring you Masha's wisdom today. Before I introduce them and their conversation partner, Alexandra Petri, I have just a few housekeeping matters. I want to invite all of you to share your questions throughout the program by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. For those interested in buying a copy of Surviving Autocracy, we have partnered with the Community Bookstore on 7th Avenue in Brooklyn, and you can find a link to purchase the book through the Community Bookstore in the chat. Finally, I want to encourage you to come to future virtual conversations presented by the Brooklyn Historical Society. Later this week, we're hosting a conversation between Leslie M. M. Bloom, author of a new book about John Hersey's reporting on Hiroshima. She'll be in conversation with the New Yorker's Adam Gopnik. And then next week, former New York State gubernatorial and attorney general candidate Zephyr Teachout will be talking about her recent book, Break Em Up. To find out more about these programs and others and to register, go to our website at brooklynhistory.org. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Masha Gessen is the author of 10 books, including the just published Surviving Autocracy, the national book award-winning, The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, and The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin, a staff writer at The New Yorker and the recipient of numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Car Carnegie Fellowship, Gessen teaches at Bard College and lives in New York City. They'll be in conversation tonight with Alexandra Petri, who writes a humor column for the Washington Post. Her new book is titled, Nothing is Wrong and Here is Why. Masha, Alexandra, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's a treat to be here. Uh, and, and Alexandra, it's, I'm totally starstruck. So. Oh, well, same. So this is, I, I'm really excited because I, I hope our conversation can mirror the journey of the book itself, where you go from sort of speechless horror to maybe slight optimism uh, that <laughs> there might be a path out. But I do feel like even though on the surface, it doesn't seem like we're a natural match, actually what we do is very similar, which is we try to explain what's going on right now using words, which right. uh, whether you're trying to do satire or just explain what's happening. Because one of the things that the book starts out by saying, and I found very striking, is that we're really bad at talking about what's going on right now, just ill-equipped to describe the things that are happening. So why do you think just the whole apparatus of folks whose job it is to talk about this are fa failing so consistently? Um, well, that's actually a great way to phrase the question, and uh, and you're phrasing it so so well because you know because because you're so much you know in the problem, right? I mean, uh, I don't know how you feel when you sit down to write a column, but I certainly often feel like I'm just trying to sort of get through the fog, and and maybe for a second I can shine a light on something, and it's like it will come into focus, and I just need to like take a snapshot before it fades out of focus again, right? Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that we just don't have the words. We don't have the language, right? I mean, we have language to describe things as they ought to be. So, like we have language for normal. And, um, and so the moment we start using those words to describe the thing we're living through, it becomes more normal, which is kind of the opposite of the effect that, 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 that we're trying to go for. Or to approach it from a different direction, um, 
a lot of the thinking that I'm using in the book actually comes from this uh, wonderful Hungarian thinker, Balint Magyar, who looked back at 1989 in Eastern Europe and said, look, you know, we we're using the wrong language to describe what was going on then. After the Soviet bloc collapsed, we started using the language of liberal democracy to describe it because we assumed that that's what was going to happen. And also because that's the language of political science, right? It's like we talk about whether there are free elections, we talk about whether there's freedom of the media, but we don't talk about what we're actually witnessing if what we're actually witnessing is not centered around whether there are free and open elections, right? Or as he puts it, you can say that the elephant cannot swim, you can say that the elephant cannot fly, but you haven't said anything about the elephant. Right, so, so he, pr he proposes a different language, which is the language of autocracy, um, which, which I, I borrow his model and try to apply it to the United States, and it works eerily well. Um, but, you know, another way to think about why it's just so hard to explain is because, um, you know, we do, like, normalize it every time we write about it, because that's what writing is. And, and uh, you know, in a way, that's what living is. Right? You wake up in the morning and you're like, okay, I'm, the sun still came up, my kids are still home, it all kind of feels the same. So it's not the apocalypse. So if I had words for the apocalypse, that's not the moment I use it because it's not the apocalypse because I'm actually living through it. Yeah, no, there's this historical flattening that you talk about where you look back into history and it seems very flat and it seems very preordained. And of course, well, these historical monsters would be clearly labeled and it wouldn't just be on a Tuesday when you had other plans that any of this would be happening. So it's, there's just the fact that it's happening right now means that A, it's not unthinkable and B, it's not I, I'm also at a loss for words in attempting to describe the things it's not. But there's also this other aspect of it that sort of has to do with language and power that you talk about, where it's not sort of straight up Orwellian, war is peace, freedom is slavery. It's a kind of hollowing out almost of words that takes place when people in power want them to mean something different. So. Right. Well, exactly. You know, it's if only, if, it were, if only for like 1984 with the glossary, right? Um, <laughs> You know, they actually told you how to use the words to mean their opposite, which is some of what I experienced in my Soviet childhood, right, was, was the use of words to mean their opposite, right? I mean, they actually used freedom to mean unfreedom. Um, but that's not the worst part of it. The worst part of it is using words to mean nothing. And, and that's what Putin does, and, and that's what Trump does. It, I mean, he just, like, piles them on. And, and sometimes you will read uh, a transcript of, a, of, 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 of an interview and even numbers in the transcript don't mean the thing that the numbers mean, right? Um, and, and again, it puts people who are writing about it, whether it's the journalist who's actually doing the interviewing or somebody who is describing it after the fact, um, in the position of trying to make sense of the nonsensical. Right? And, but then on the other hand, you can't just like dismiss it and say, okay, well, that means nothing. Because while it means nothing on the face of it, it has real life consequences, right? I mean, he says, inject yourself with, with disinfectant. And then he says, I was kidding. And like both of those statements mean nothing on the face of them. It's nonsensical to propose to inject yourself with disinfectant. And also he said he didn't mean it because he was kidding. But people are calling poison centers because they've either done it or are considering doing it. So that's real life consequences. So it has meaning, but it's not meaning that's connected to world to words, and then you know your brain breaks. You know exactly because you you say in the book that there's sort of a typical lie. You can diffuse it because someone will say, well, you know, the the moon is purple, and but it's susceptible to being corrected with facts. And if you just apply enough facts to it, suddenly it'll it'll diffuse it and it'll go away. And instead you get this sort of themeless pudding, sort of a word salad. Although I guess salads are sort of nourishing and contain vegetables and bonuses. I feel like word salad is actually a pos too positive for what you get, where you're actually in the course of writing it down, A, making it sound like it's a, a normal series of sentences for a person to say, and B, trying to sort of figure out, well, what does this mean? And so you talked about the phenomenon where people will go and say, well, 
he said he wants to buy Greenland and here's what that would look like. And suddenly there's a whole policy where there was just sort of a ramble. <laughs> right, exactly. No, that's, I mean, that's, that's the thing is that we, um, was, with the exception actually of you, right? Most, of, most people who write for newspapers and, and magazines are in the position of describing this as if it were politics, right? As if it were, you know, when he says he's going to buy Greenland as, as if it, that were diplomacy, diplomacy right? Um, or when he is flailing about for whoever he's going to appoint acting something next, is if that reflected policy priorities, an actual phrase that the New York Times has actually used when he was like going to hire somebody, that that is going to tell us what Trump's policy priorities are, as though he had policy and as though he had priorities. And with that, you know, um, but I actually want to go back to the, to the question of lies, right? Because I think that his lies are more on the order of the moon is purple, right? Um, because, I mean, if somebody says the moon is purple, uh, and and they're completely impervious to your saying, but 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 wait a second, it's not. That's very much like Trump, right? Because um, most of the lying I think that we encounter in life is lying that's actually intended to deceive, right? Deceive in the sense of um, you know, convince you of something that isn't so. You know, I'm like I'm trying to convince you that the dog ate my homework. Um, but he's not. He's just claiming his right to say whatever he wants whenever he wants to. Right? It's the power lie. It's like the moon is purple, or it is, um, you know, it's raining in this room right now. I mean, he lies about the weather. That's one of my favorite examples because he lies about the weather fairly consistently. Um, and it's an amazing power move because what are you going to do when somebody is lying about the weather? Um, you can't, because he's president, choose not to engage with it. But you also, you know, you, you either have to like go and move into his weather with him because it's appealing and at least you don't have to resist because your resistance is futile. No, exactly. How Borg-like. But it's also an interesting question of what's the purpose. And an example that you use that I keep coming back to is sort of the way language gets negotiated where it's like, what you think this means is it's something you can debate, but it, what I'm doing, using it for is to assert power over you. And so, I mean, where, where we get the term alternative facts, it's, I mean, everyone made fun of that and said, well, clearly you, you can see on its face that alternative facts, that's just one of those oxymoronic jumbo shrimp, um, et cetera. I, I, suddenly all the oxymoron examples, usually my brain is just replete with them or they've all flown out the window. But instead of seeing it as an oxymoron, it's actually, that phrase does capture, it says, here's a set of, here's a reality and we'd like you to live in it with us just on our whim, not because it'll open any more useful truth to you. But then when you have a pandemic, you wind up with the consequences of being asked to live in this thing that isn't quite reality because you start, in order to behave as though it's true, you wind up having devastating human consequences. Yes, but you know, uh, I mean, that is like, that is the really awful um, part that unfortunately, uh, I feel like I have some tools to, for understanding just from living uh, and writing, living in the Soviet Union and writing in Russia and writing uh, and living in Russia. Because, you know, when you have a fabric of society that's frayed enough, you can ignore human consequences to an extraordinary extent. I mean, basically until you're touched personally. And even then, like, um, I actually had a student last semester whose entire family, he was from this evangelical family, and the entire family had COVID fairly early on. And still, they thought it was, uh, it was, simultaneously a conspiracy, a fake, a hoax, and caused by sex with demons, right? Um, and, um, and they continued not wearing masks and smoking, right? And, um, you know, all of those things could be, could be, could be true at the same time, but, but it, you know, if we're assuming uh, that people do feel some discomfort when, when they're living in complete contradiction, 
you know, they can avoid living in contradiction for a very long time. If you don't have a shared reality space, if you don't have a shared media space, and if you live you know, outside a big city, I mean, um, the thing is, uh, driving in the United States, you can't really tell the difference between a closed shopping mall and an open shopping mall, you know, except the number of cars parked there. You can't really tell the difference between people who are, who are healthy, uh, you know, in a closed uh, suburban house and people who are desperately ill, right? I mean, we are living already in such a, with a, such a breakdown of community and such a, <clears throat> and such a complete absence of, of, of again, of, of local media of, of, and your shared media that you can just think that COVID doesn't exist until it comes to get you or even after that. Um, and that's a much more comfortable place to inhabit uh, because otherwise you're stuck living with these two realities, you know, one that is being performed for you on television all the time and one that is actually fact-based. And I think we underestimate the incredible stress and the incredible anxiety that just, just living in a country that is, that is, that is split between two realities um, causes. Yeah, because it's difficult to figure out how do you bridge a reality war, because if people have agreed on sets of facts, I mean, you can at least converse within that. And so that used to be one of the functions of sort of the news media is, well, here's some people we can trust to tell us what's going on since we can't be everywhere. We can't look into all of those malls and all of those houses and see what's going on. And so we have to be able to believe what they're telling us is going on inside of those. But then you have two separate reality purveyors where one of their jobs is not to tell you that at all. And I, so I sort of, how do you get back to a place where people can believe what they're being described? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, um, that's, that's the really, really awful question. And the thing is that, um, you know, those of us who are living, uh, who, who are clinging to fact-based reality, right? We actually have to contend with the fact that there's another reality uh, in, the, in the same country. Those who don't choose to cling to the fact-based reality, they can just live in the Fox universe. Like that's entirely possible. It is encapsulated and it is impervious to, 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 to input from the outside. Uh, so it's an unequal choice. But, um, but, you know, how do we get back to a shared space? I mean, the question is, is, is it possible? Um, I love the way that in an old book, I think Jay Rosen describes the media as, uh, or the job of the media as telling you, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but what's going on in what you perceive as your community, but that you can't see, right? It's a very simple way of thinking about the media. Um, but I think there's, it, 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 it gets to a key point, which is that, you know, like, do you, do I perceive people who live in Texas as living in the same community as I live in? Like, is that, is that what's going on? Or is that an abstraction and like, you know, is it the moon is purple, right? And so the answer is that in order to get back to some sort of shared media space, we have to create a sense of, a of living in the same society. Um, and that, you know, that gets us to like vision and, and, and political leadership and all sorts of amazing stuff that we don't have at the moment. And I think that also gets to the question of sort of the defining of us-ness, which comes up in the book a good deal, where if you don't view, where sort of the aspirational ideal of America has always been, well, we're a work in progress and we're gonna pretend that certain positive things are true about ourselves and we can eventually hopefully make them true for an ever expanding group of people. And that's sort of the optimistic promise. And instead, one of the factors of sort of the key traits of Trumpism has been to narrow and narrow and narrow what's meant by us and the set of people to whom the boons of American society should apply. So and I feel like the dividing of the media habitats is, also doing the work of really delineating who is us, who is this for, in a potent and alarming way. But yeah, so how do you re-usify? <laughs> how do you re-usify? Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, 
I think the division of, of, of America has been this, uh, this, this aspirational vision of, of, of an infinitely expansive us. And that's the vision of democracy, right? Democracy is the government of the governed and you will never have total democracy. You will never have um, a perfect government of the governed. So it's, it's always a kind of movement. It's always, it's always trying to get to the place where you have a government of the people, for the people, by the people. And so then Trump comes along and says, nah, you know, like not, you know, we're going in that direction was just like, that was complicated and, and all sorts of bad stuff and, and, um, and scary and incredibly anxiety provoking. And I'm going to, I'm going to take you back to a place where, where there was a narrow, right? Or it was, it was, it was much smaller, it was not expansive, but we weren't going anywhere. <clears throat> and, um, and also, you know, a mean place, a base place, a place where you can be your worst self and revel in it. Um, and how do you contract it? Um, unfortunately, you know, I think that the Democratic Party has, uh, certainly in 2016, and I'm you know, like terrified about what's happening now with the Biden campaign, because I think they didn't grasp that basic problem, right? That promise of the imaginary past, the promise of going to to a horrible mean place and having a great old cruel time there, right? Um, and and focused on how he was incompetent and and how you know very good management is much better than very bad management. And um, and that's just not how you contract the appeal of that. Um, and I, I, I you know maybe it's stupid, but I think that you contract the appeal to to your worst self by an appeal to your best self. Uh, and you contract the appeal to, of the imaginary past with an appeal to a glorious future. Right? And I see that in the politics of, for example, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, right? I mean, she is like that. She talks about, she talks to your best self. Um, she soars and makes, invites you to soar with her. And, and you can see that she imagines an entirely different world, like one where you would actually like to live. Um, and that's what we need. I mean, that's what political vision is. Um, and, and I imagine that um, if, if that is an offer, there will be a surprisingly huge number of people in this country who will say, oh yeah, okay, let's, you know, let's go back to, the, to, to, to this wonderful feeling of moral aspiration. Um, but it has to be you know, uplifting. It has, to, it has to have the promise of success in it. It, um, and um, it, it has it, it, it has to it has to be inviting and, and and beautiful. And I think there's also it's funny we've been coming across all of these different words for ruling. You've got autocrats, you've got technocrats, you've got cacistocracy. Just really every single time of type of ruler you can have. And if the idea that we'll get someone who's technically competent, and sure that's an improvement, but it's sort of a long bumper sticker. Um, and <laughs> So I think one of the questions, though, is getting back to what you were talking about with the Soviet Union, is that words like freedom is sort of aspirational language. I mean, even President Obama had difficulty sort of, and he reached the higher register, as you said, more often than you usually do. Usually you say, I'm going to do a competent thing, probably, for sure, for constituents. And he was using almost poetic language. And even that register was still lower than just because people have started getting a little antsy around optimistic words. So what do we do about that language facet of the inspirational idea? Oh, I think we just have to be audacious about it. Um, but, um, you know, and like you have to insist on meaning. Uh, that's the thing about language. And I think, I think it's up to us too. Um, it's not only politicians who have to, to be audacious in, the, in their use of language we have to be really rigorous, like we journalists. Uh, like for example, stop using the word politics to mean anything bad. Um, so many political reporters, even the best ones, will say things like, oh, that's just politics, by which they mean that's electoral positioning, right? But politics is the way that we get together and, and decide how we live together in a, in a, in a city or a state or, or a nation or the world, right? I mean, it is the most amazing thing of all. Um, it can never be just politics. Right? It's like awesomeness itself. 
Um, and and, I, and I, I think we have to try to reclaim that language. What uh, I mentioned in the book that I worked as a journalist in Russia in the 1990s as a Russian language journalist. And, and I, was, I, I had the very strange experience throughout that decade of writing in both languages. Uh, and so I could compare what it felt like to write in English to what it felt like to write in Russian. And, you know, in Russian, I had the post-totalitarian language at my disposal. I, it, it was injured. It was, it was damaged. Uh, it was very hard to use because political language was completely discredited. <clears throat> and aspirational language and, like, passionate language and romantic language, everything was discredited. Like, they managed to trash almost every register. So all you had was, like, verbs and nouns. And, full Hemingway. Uh, I'm sorry? Just go full Hemingway. Yeah, exactly. Full Hemingway. Um, but, um, but, you know, and like directly observable and measurable uh, and demonstrable. Like this incredibly narrow register. It was very, very hard to write. Uh, if you, you know, take away all the adjectives and adverbs and, um, and try to stick to the facts and then make it interesting. Uh, and, and then I would, I would write the same story or, you know, a story in, on, a, on a similar topic um, in English for an American audience. And suddenly I had all this stuff at my disposal that I couldn't use in Russian. And so that taught me that uh, how much you can damage a language, but also that you can reinvent the language of journalism if you think about it. Now, this actually ties in nicely to one of the questions that we've just gotten in from the uh, ever-increasing uh, line of questions, which is how should media report on Trump's actions and words in a way that doesn't risk rationalizing or normalizing? Well, I think we have to admit that it's, it, it is um, a trap, right? Um, as I mentioned, you can't report on something that is meaningless as meaningless when it actually has real life meaning, right? And so, and, 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 and Trumpism is full of these contradictions that, that entrap journalists. Uh, so I think we have to keep that in mind. And I think we have to think of journalism as a kind of process of harm reduction, right? So there will be harm done. Is there a way that I can minimize my contribution to that harm? Or is there a way that I can contribute to minimizing that harm? Right? Um, so I think that, uh, that um, I can point to some successful projects. Like I think, um, I think uh, the podcast Trump Inc., which is my absolute favorite podcast, is incredibly successful. And what I, I think the secret of their success, and for those who don't know, it's the WNYC podcast um, that builds itself as an open investigation into Trump's businesses. <clears throat> and, and the open investigation is a brilliant idea, right? I mean, that's, it's really revolutionary for journalism to just kind of say, okay, we don't know where we're going with this. We're going to be doing this in real time with a lot of interaction with the audience, with a lot of tips from the audience. So it's radically transparent, very much like the work of, of, of David Farnholt uh, at, at the Washington Post, which is also radically transparent. But what's great about Trump is that they also try to describe Trumpism as a system all the time. It's like that elephant. They're always mindful of the fact that they're trying to describe the elephant, right? So that creates a kind of estrangement that that, that avoids normalizing, right? And they're always like looking at it like, oh my God, look at this. So none of that is normal. Um, I think another approach, you know, which is your approach, which is like um, just great for sanity uh, is focusing on the ridiculousness of it. Because, uh, and I think, you know, um, part of, uh, it, Part of what makes humor so appealing as a way of covering the news in this period is that you read the New York Times and you think you're going insane. <laughs> because they just use the words policy priority, right? In, uh, uh, about Trump. And because the, their institutional culture, and, you know, and I have sympathy for the New York Times in that sense, right? It's like, if I were the New York Times, I wouldn't want to just throw my institutional culture out the window. That's my biggest asset. Right? So what do I do? Like, how do I stay the New York Times and deal with this? Um, 
so so they exercise extreme restraint and they and they and they and they do things like I mean I think they make mistakes like I think they underuse the word lie I think they underuse the word racist I think they overuse false equivalencies but they're also sort of held hostage by by this institutional culture and then um, you can read your column in the Washington Post which is just treating this as as ridiculous as it actually is and it's like an injection of sanity. Right? <laughs> And no, I think what, one of the, yeah. the weird things about it is it simultaneously is ridiculous, but is having these human consequences that is hard to separate. I always say I wish I, that there, I could have had a Trump administration that happened in a snow globe and I could just watch it and laugh at it and nobody would be injured by it. But instead, we're all trapped in the snow globe with it. And so you, you know, it's hard to figure out how you can say it's, it's ridiculous because so I think the idea of describing it as a system, like a, it's a phenomena where the words, it's a phenomena, not a phenomena. I'm going to keep that singular word going. Uh, where the words have meaning, but it's not the thing, the thing said. That was just mind blowing and very exciting to me as a way of, as a framework for thinking about all of this. Because it's sort of the thing where if your neighbor walks out every Thursday and sets his lawn on fire and starts chanting until the elder God appears, there's a certain moment where you're like, well, that's Thursday. This happens every Thursday. So like, I know people in the media are always saying, well, like even as recently as a couple of weeks ago, there was this thing where they thought, oh, he pivoted to a more presidential tone. And just this, I, someday we're gonna wake up and there's gonna be a presidential tone and it's gonna happen any day now. And just this sort of strange, like almost millennial in the sense of we're waiting for this <laughs> promised day, not in the sense that, oh, we love avocado toast and hate home ownership, uh, desire for some presidential moment that you, you also document, like, what's that about? Why do we, why do people keep saying, oh, but today he became president? It's like, no, no, he didn't. I think, I think we long to live in a normalcy. I mean, look, I, like, um, I remember watching him on March 11th when he gave his, after, you know, six weeks of saying that coronavirus was a hoax, just the flu, it was going to miraculously disappear. Suddenly he sits down and, you know, was it like, I think nine minutes of somber tone. I mean, the things he said were ridiculous, like we're well prepared and I've just banned all the flights, all flights from Europe, so we're gonna be fine. But I remember a distinct sense of relief that like his tone was subdued and, uh, and he mostly spoke in complete sentences. I was like, yes, okay, we're like having a moment of sanity here. Um, and I'm not even given to, you know, to, to, to considering the possibility of, of a moment of sanity. But you know what, I, I actually have a question for you because um, I know that like in Russia at a certain point, satire became really, really hard because things just got so absurd that the very, um, kind of standard device of just taking something and uh, to its absurd logical extreme and thereby showing up its, 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 its humor potential, like that disappeared because it was already there. It was already at its absurd logical extreme. And then there, for a while, there was this news site that was absolutely brilliant. It was like romantic. It was actually fakes. It was things as they ought to be. Right. Um, so our equivalent would be Trump suddenly actually being presidential. And like that would be humor. Um, because because it had already you know, gone so far to the to the, to, on the absurdity scale that you couldn't possibly go any further. Like, have you have you actually encountered any of that in, in your own work? Like, have you tried to write about something and realize I, I can't I can't I can't make it any bigger? Yeah, no, all the time. That's the biggest, because usually you think, well, if I just heighten this to 11, then everyone will say, oh, well, this shouldn't have been happening when it was, it was at a three, but now that I see what it would have led to, and it's already the thing that it would have led to. So yeah, you have to do like the romantic approach. That's a good adjective for it. But I think sometimes just figuring out if I thought this were going well, what would I say? Or if, if, if this were going well, how would it be different? And you can sometimes sort of, jo sort of jostle and have that moment of recognition. Because I think the whole th thing where you're reading the New York Times and you think, I'm losing it. If you can have somebody sort of look you in the eye and say, no, I also see it. I think that's, and you mentioned 
uh, and I'm going to get to, back to more of the questions in a second, but you mentioned this whole sort of emperor's new clothes thing where ideally the way the story works is that uh, everyone says, oh, he's, he's naked and we don't respect a, a naked monarch uh, and we're going to do something about it now. But with Trump, he sort of is like, I'm, I'm tossing off the mask. No one's wearing masks, not in my America in any way, shape or form. And so sort of exposing him and, and pointing at him doesn't quite work. Like he's already been creating the reality TV version of himself. So that's another dimension to it too. It was like, how do you, it, it feels almost like he's impervious to it. He is impervious to it. And um, yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is where like uh, you and I are getting into this, okay, you know, <laughs> the, the, uh, sense of, of helplessness and inability to, to 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 describe it, but yeah, it's like it's like he is he is the naked emperor who is running down the street screaming, "I'm naked! Uh, I have no clothes!" Um, and and yeah, you can't expose him because because he is already being the worst possible version. Of, of, yeah, of, it's not going to be devastating to say, "Oh, he's got no clothes on," because he's sitting there saying, "I'm going to shoot people in Fifth Avenue," and I'm a right. raging id. Um, yeah, so. Which brings me to a question, I guess, which is even with our system of checks and balances, how easy is it for the United States to devolve into a totalitarian state? I feel like that question is a little bit out of date because the system of checks and balances has taken a little bit of a beating in the last three and a half years. Um, you know, I mean, Americans have this, uh, so, uh, you know, the book is in three sections and the first section is called Institutions Will Not Save You or Have Not Saved Us. Uh, uh, and um, and it's really uh, the reason that a third of the book is about institutions is because Americans have this almost religious faith in institutions. Like we imbue them with, with two magical qualities, the quality of self-repair right, um, and the quality of, of independent functioning. Like they're, they, they're in a vacuum. We usually, like, they were created 250 years ago and, and they're just there. And they're going to create justice and they're going to create checks and balances, they're going to create fairness. And in fact, they can't function in a vacuum and they can't repair themselves and they can't even stand up to a bad actor. And we have seen that with the courts, right? Which on the one hand, he's, he's packed the courts. He's appointed more federal judges than any president before him at this point. And, um, and he's appointed two Supreme Court justices, which is just bad, really, really horrible luck. But he has also acted toward the courts um, and toward the whole judicial system like, like a real estate developer in New York acts toward City Hall, right? It's an obstacle. It's, it's, it's something to get around. It's an annoyance. It's not, it's not a negotiation and it's certainly not a check on him, right? It's just an annoyance. So it's like if they're not granting him a variance, he's going to figure out a way to get around it, you know, write it up differently, like happened with the travel bans, uh, you know, 2.0, 3.0, until it finally um, got through, was held up by the, by the court. And, you know, and the same thing is going to happen with DACA. But then there's the other problem, which is that you just also can say, okay, I'm going to ignore the court's decision. Right? And, um, and at the same time, he is also destroying the, the system of checks and balances. Um, by uh, in b ways that are legal and illegal, right? Like banning uh, White, White House staff um, from testifying in the impeachment hearings while, when they were subpoenaed is illegal. And he got away with it. Firing a series of inspectors general who were the actual people who actually do the work of oversight on behalf of Congress is legal but completely you know runs against the culture and all possible norms and he's gotten away with it but to give you a, an idea of the uh, of the of the extent right or the rate at which we're moving so during the impeachment hearings in the fall stanford law professor pam carlin said when she was trying to explain why ukraine was an abuse an example of abuse of power she said imagine if the president denied disaster funding to a state because the state 
wasn't do, uh, you know, was doing something that, or the governor of the state was refusing to do something that he wanted the governor to do. And she was using it as a hypothetical on the assumption that it was so obvious, so obviously unimaginable, so obvious an abuse of power that it would illustrate why Ukraine was bad. And six months later, we're living through that and it just kind of happens like yet another news story, you know, the, the, the Thursday example that, that she gave. It happened and, and moved right on. Um, and that's just the rate at which things that can be used as example of some, uh, as a hypothetical example of something outrageous become just part of our political reality. Yeah, if there's one lesson from the Trump reality, it's don't ever make an analogy thinking, well, this analogy will certainly show people what a bridge too far looks like because anywhere from a few weeks to six months down the line, you're gonna be living inside that analogy. Exactly. And no, yeah, and, and it was amazing how little impact that story had and for, for how stunning it was that the idea that, oh, well, blue states will primarily be affected, then we don't need to worry about this virus and we can blame the governors. And it just, you know, it just evaporated into the news cycle. It, it evaporated in the news cycle because, I mean, what is the adequate reaction to it? But also um, because at this point, it's not surprising. It's It's not even... And this is, this is an extraordinary thing, right? Um, because like there's certain things that happen in autocracies uh, and even they've even happened in Russia a, a couple of times. When something that we know to be true is exposed and everyone is outraged because it is the very definition of obscenity, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's yes, we know it exists, but it's, we're never supposed to see it. But Trump is obscene all the time. And so even that, you know, veil is, is, is gone. Like, I, at this point, it's very hard to imagine something that would feel obscene with this presidency, that something that would be exposed and we wouldn't just move right on to the next story. It's sort of tied to that question of sort of willingness to see and be shocked by things. Uh, one of the questions is, was there an analogous set in Soviet society that was willingly accepted the received truth or sort of Pravda ignoring reality around them, all of those who rely on Fox News today? Well, I mean, the Soviet, Soviet society was totalitarian. So, um, so the basic compact with the totalitarian society is that everyone agrees to live in the reality that is handed to them by, um, by the Pravda, right? And, um, and you never know what the Pravda is going to say. Um, there's, I think, a common misconception, uh, an intuitive misconception that, oh, you just like knew what the ideology was and you had to stick to it. But no, it was actually quite dynamic. You never knew what it might be. There were very few kind of pillars, right? You know, other than uh, proletariats of the world unite, everything was kind of up for grabs. So you had to keep up to date on who was the enemy du jour and who was the friend du jour and who, you know, what, what the correct line of thinking was. And that is a mechanism for robbing people of any ability to form opinions or any ability to even process facts. Uh, because when it's a matter of survival to be able to absorb and retain today's political line, that's all you do. Right, you just you just absorb it, and and then you know that's that that that's where you live. Yeah, you consume information very differently, uh, and it, which another question sort of off of this, which is the questioner says, I'd seen a post regarding the idea that in order to be autocratic, a government need not explicitly police speech if it has citizens doing that job for them. Do you think that statement seems true to our social state, and is it cause for concern? Um. You know, I mean, I, I use the word autocracy uh, quite purposefully because um, because it's general enough. It encompasses uh, all different kinds of autocracy, including totalitarianism, right? So I think that that, uh, that is a better description of totalitarianism, where there's a lot of horizontal enforcement, and that's kind of where the economy of terror comes in. Uh, really, in a totalitarian country, you don't have to like, imprison tens of millions of people. You just have to imprison a few and create the fear of uh, uh, the, the, the realistic um, <clears throat> threat to everybody's safety. That's what terror is. 
But an autocracy need not be totalitarian. And this is again where I, uh, I, I go to Balin Magyar's work because he has looked at all these post-Soviet autocracies um, of which there are now many, unfortunately. And there are other autocracies that he hasn't looked at, but, 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 but that develop in similar ways. And he talks about not so much controlling the information sphere as dominating the information sphere. And that's something that I think Trump does intuitively and really, really well. And you know, he doesn't exactly crack down on freedom of speech, at least not yet, right? It, he has a debilitating effect on speech. He makes it harder for us to think. He makes it harder for us to, you know, to perceive information. And he makes it much, much harder for us to communicate with one another. And he, can, he, he dominates the information sphere in a number of different ways, including sort of generating this uh, endless stream of, of, of news, including endless, endless stream of lies. But it's also like living in, in, in static, living in, in, a, in, 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 in a state of constant pollution, right? It's like, it's like in a really, really polluted city where you kind of can't really see, right? Because the, the air is full of like particles of, 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 of pollution and, and, and you're constantly moving through fog. And I think that that's what we've been living through. Yeah, you get these thick lungfuls of sort of meaningless words and where as words become more and more meaningless and as everything just sort of floods the zone, it becomes harder to talk about things than really, when you really do mean them. I mean, like fake news, for example, used to be a word that meant something, as you point out. And then it has evaporated into just sort of a, a term of opprobrium whenever you don't like a news story. You say, oh, that's fake news. And that's, I mean, the sense in which I've even heard journalists where you'll be joking, be like, oh, fake news. And it's like, well, we've we surrendered the battle on the branding of that term, for sure. Right. Um, and then you have that path in your mind and that's the way you keep thinking from that point. And so another question from a reader, which is how useful is it to talk about the present day collapse of democracy as though it were a product of Trump without massively considering that it's a GOP that is creating, implementing, fostering and advertising this destruction of democracy? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And I think that there, um, you know, there are two non-mutually contradictory ways of thinking about Trump. One, which is much more common, is this way of thinking about Trump, or talking about Trump at least, as, as an anomaly. As like, you know, he, he, he just is alien to the entire American political culture, and he came possibly from outer space, or at least from Russia, and, um, and we just have to get rid of him and go back to normal. And then there's another way of talking about Trump, which is, oh, he's just another Republican president. And I think that actually you have to think both of those thoughts at the same time. Uh, I think that the conditions for Trump were laid over the last 20 years at least. And they were laid in large part by our reaction to 9-11, you know, by the concentration of power in the executive branch, by the creation of the domestic surveillance state, by the creation of this American identity as a nation under siege, as you know, being surrounded by animals, uh, by enemies, uh, and and then there's there's another stream, which is the the continuing and sort of bloated marriage of money uh, and, and politics, which uh, just went from from horrible to absurd and evil, um, and all of those things have influenced both the ability of someone like Trump to come to uh, to. Uh, you know, to, to take power, but also our understanding of what the presidency is. And then along comes Trump, who is also anomalous, right? And the combination of those things gives us Trump. And yes, absolutely, the GOP is played a huge role in laying the groundwork. And now they are, they inhabit his autocracy. Uh, in, in the book, I talk about the difference in political audiences in a democracy and an autocracy. In a democracy, a politician's audience is their voters. They are accountable to them. They are at least performing for them because their voters will can take, you know, take them out of the job. And in an autocracy, the audience is always the autocrat because he is the one who holds the power to whether you have your job, your power, your money. And the Republican Party lives in an autocracy 
because the person who can commit political murder by tweet is Donald Trump. You know, it's whether or not a Republican politician is reelected actually depends on what Trump is tweeting. And, um, and so he is their audience. Whereas for the Democratic Party, it's still largely the voters and the donors. No, I think it's also interesting because the extent to which he's a reality TV person, where, I mean, the, the word reality in reality television is one of those sort of telling oxymorons that should really have clued us into what a dangerous exactly. person he'd be to put in charge of anything, where you can fix it all in post and then everything will be as great and as big and as unique as you said it was. But it also means that sort of the version of himself that's on TV is the version of himself that is almost sort of, I mean, not being a close personal friend of his, I don't know that it's more real than he is as a person, but it's it's that the image that he's so keen on constructing. And so like the Lincoln Project and various other people have been buying ads in the DC market during a presidential year, just so like goes to the president so he can see on television certain visions of himself or not. And just the, the idea that like his team has to spend money, not that the Lincoln Project's his team, but his team also is spending money to advertise to him how good he looks is just is a, is a more evidence for your point that he's the audience. He's the one that you're not pitching the voters anymore at this point. Absolutely. And it's like, uh, again, that's something that I'm very familiar with. Putin, who took over Russian television within a year of coming to power, and now he's been watching his own television for 20 years. Um, but it's, it's a small enough universe and you can actually see, yeah, he saw that and then he reacted to it and then it was reflected back to him. And that's how reality is shaped. But there, you know, there's done through control. He actually, uh, the state actually controls all broadcast television. And, and, and here it's, it's done through domination. And it's also, so uh, a, another question, which is what country is safe? Or how does a country protect against the impending threat that is evident by the US example? I don't think there's such a thing. I mean, again, that's the idea behind that question, I think, is, oh, how do we build perfect institutions? Or how do we build, uh, how do we write the perfect constitution? And I think if anything, uh, what the last three and a half years have taught us is that that's not actually how it works, right? You can't, I mean, laws are important, uh, but they're important to the extent that they represent our agreements, right? They represent an ongoing negotiation. They represent the way that we, uh, we have promised one another to live together. And that's the only way to, to do it. You can't, you know, like, um, you, you can't put it in place one, once and for all and live there. No, it's interesting. I've been trying to read up on the end of the Roman Empire. Just no reason, just randomly <laughs> these days, just a little light escapism. And the idea is always that people think, well, if we have a sufficiently complicated structure, it won't happen here. And so, I mean, the founders, when they were getting started here, they were sitting there, with, well, we know what went wrong in Rome, so we won't have an ideal and we won't have a, you know, a quaestor. That system's bad. But if we could just come up with something where we have enough balances and checks. But as you say, if individuals aren't inhabiting the system and meaning what they're saying within it, then the institutions don't have a life of their own where you can push a button and activate check. It just fizzles. So, which I think sort of ties back into your question of like moral authority. And so maybe the optimistic thing lurking at the end of this is that there are still people who are trying to create a better vision for us to live inside. And if we can all keep having our words mean things, they can get us to that point, perhaps? I, I think, you know, we still have that possibility. And um, there's, I mean, there's a commonplace in, in political theory that times of crisis are also always times of, of opportunity. And, and I think we mean some specific things by that, right? That like um, ideas that seem completely marginal during peacetime, and that might make, it would take decades to penetrate the mainstream in stable times, can be, get picked up and absorbed really, really quickly, right? So there can be times of revolutionary change um, if, if, in times of crisis. And I think we've actually seen a lot of that happen over the last six months. Right? Within the first couple of weeks of the, the, of, of the pandemic in this country, 
I think we finally saw uh, universal healthcare just become completely absorbed into the culture. I wish, you know, uh, the Democratic Party had gotten the memo, but um, but I think it is, it, it's kind of an unmovable uh, piece of the conversation now. Um, I think we even saw universal basic income get absorbed into, into mainstream conversation. Uh, also in the course of like a couple of weeks at the beginning of the pandemic. And then of course, with the beginning of the uprising at the end of May, ideas about defunding or abolishing the police and, and Black Lives Matter went from something you know out there for most people to like a completely central piece of the political conversation for most people right and so that shows us how quickly things can move and what kinds of positive change we can have and what kind of like amazing imaginative conversation we can have at this time precisely because it's so awful and so destabilizing. Yeah, instead of just opening the Overton window the opposite direction, it's like, well, hey, maybe we can think bigger. Maybe. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, a lot of the discussion that we've had, and, you know, I probably think it's fascinating because I'm a journalist, uh, but then, you know, you probably think it's fascinating too, but a lot of the conversation that was also caused, you know, among journalists um, by the protests has had to do with what are the limits of legitimate debate, right? And 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 where are the borders of, of legitimate debate? Like like the Tom Cotton op-ed in the New York Times, calling for the uh, for for calling in the military to uh, um, to control the protests. And you know, was that within the bounds of the legitimate debate? And I think we basically kind of agreed, no, it's not within the bounds of legitimate debate which is an extraordinary thing because it represents the position of this state at the moment, right? So you can, and, and then on the other hand, uh, ideas like abolishing the police are part of legitimate debate. Um, but that was fascinating and, because it's, yeah, it's, it, going into the whole idea of sort of like the, un, the unthinkable is happening. So it can't be unthinkable and yet there's gotta be some way of talking about it. So like what kind of, platform should this idea have if it's a real idea that's out there, but it's not one that we think is acceptable. Um, and right. that's you, been fascinating you, to see. Yeah, and so, you know, that's, that's the opening. Um, and I just, I mean, I'm, I'm like desperately scared that that momentum that we have from the protests will, will be lost by November. I think that's a real danger. Um, but that's, but it also represents our best hope. Like if we can hold on to that, if we can keep that conversation going and we can, if we can keep sort of pointing toward a vision that it brings into existence, then we'll be saved. Yeah. And one of the people you mentioned was John Lewis as a counterpoint to what President Trump, who kept really tweeting against him vehemently, but as a, just a person who really embodied the idea that, no, you can change things. You can reach that reality that doesn't exist yet and broaden the us and all of these things. Yeah, I mean, there was, um, it was one, one of his first, uh, remember it was, uh, Representative Lewis said that he wasn't coming to the inauguration and Trump went berserk on Twitter and stayed berserk on Twitter. Uh, it was kind of amazing because like normally he wouldn't hold on to any topic for more than a couple of hours. And this was just, he was just like with it, like a dog with a bun, which was the first time that I really started thinking about how intuitively, and you know, and with him, it's like, it's all performance, right? But intuitively, he just knows that, that he has to react to moral aspiration because moral aspiration is the only threat to the kind of, po of power that he promises that, the, that he embodies. And I think I'm going to do one final question from the pool, which is, so assuming that Biden wins and Trump leaves office, what do we as a society need to do to make the next Trump, which the poster thinks might be Cotton or Hawley, less likely to succeed? Um, well, we have to reinvent ourselves. I mean, the worst thing we could possibly do is pretend that we can just kind of breathe a sigh of relief and go back to a pre-Trump normal. Right? 
And, um, and we really have to challenge this idea that there was a pre-Trump normal. There was a pre-Trump abnormal that made Trump possible, not predetermined, right, but possible. And so, so we have to reinvent ourselves. And I think we have a bunch of, 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 of things to address, uh, of which you know, radical inequality is, is one. Um, and, and another is our lack of, um, of, 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 of local media. Right. As long as we don't have local media, which has been basically gone extinct, um, we're not going to have a shared politics. We're not really going to have politics. Right? And that means we, I think we have to reconsider our entire idea of how uh, uh, media function and take it out of the hands of private corporations. And by that, I mean, of course, you know, the, the, the Facebook and, and, and Google as well. And, um, and reinvent the public sphere. And then that, that's all. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, all that's all that it will take. <laughs> but no, but that's that's possible. That is doable. It and is possible. It is doable. We just have to imagine that it's doable. I mean, we just have to be able to imagine the best in the same kind of daring way that he imagines the worst. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely right. I know one of the things people talk about in science fiction these days, they're like, too much dystopia. Everyone's written all these wonderful detailed dystopias. Let's start imagining a way that things might go well, like a positive future. Like, let's re spend our imaginative space on that. And so thank you, even in the very dark uh, underground gloom of this time for having a book that suggested maybe what the way out of the tunnel might be. Thank you. I mean, it's harder. It's much. It's so much easier to write about um, all the ways in which we're screwed. Um, but um, and it's and it's obviously much much harder to 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 write about possibilities. And even when you're writing about possibilities, it's always easier to write about the doomsday doomsday possibilities uh, than about glorious possibilities. But that's what we have to do. Absolutely. No, it's funny, and I, reading any utopian book, I'm always like, well, this actually sounds just as bad as the dystopia that somebody else was picturing. <laughs> but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. The point is, okay. yeah, it's, it's a bridge. That's not a terrible problem to have. Yeah. No, but so thank you again for conversing and for the book. Everyone go and uh, support a bookstore of your choice. Uh, actually, no, click on the link. There's a link provided. So click on that link. and get your copy of Surviving Autocracy right now. And uh, thank you again so much for a fruitful chat. Thank you so much for, for reading the book and, um, and asking questions. And it's a, it's a huge honor to talk to you. Oh, well, likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This was really nifty. I'm like, I, I just want to like kick notes and <laughs> I have a giant page of notes. It's like king of reality. <laughs> Chaos <laughs> is a ladder. Thank you. Oops. Oh, I vanished. <laughs>